Welcome to the next episode of The Amateur Wino. Today we'll be visiting the Russian River Valley of California and stopping in at Copan Wines for some barrel tastings. We also sat down with winemaker Wells Guthrie, who was profiled recently in the New York Times in an article about the direction of California Pinot Noir. We talked with Wells about how his Pinot Noirs are made, and here's that chat right now. Okay, we're chatting with Wells Guthrie, who's the winemaker at Copan Wines. Um, thanks so much for, for joining us today, Wells. No um, your winery was recently profiled in the New York Times in an article about the direction of California Pinot Noir. And I just wanted to ask you, um, it mentioned that you had kind of changed your winemaking philosophy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, basically it was just uh, tasting a lot of the older wines that I had made. And I uh, didn't feel like they were kind of holding up as well as they wanted to. They were showing their age a little more. And, and frankly, the, the fruit profile was showing kind of this kind of more candy compote profile that, uh, frankly, I didn't like. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to drink, you know, for Pinot Noir, for me, I hold Burgundy as the highest benchmark. Um, okay. And, I, you know, something that I was struggling with was trying to, uh, again, have this kind of candy aspect of the wines. Um, I mean, I know I'm, I mean, would uh, say I made big heavy wines in the past, but mm -hmm. I, I do know that I was, well, I was guilty or lack of where to say it. Uh, you know, I'd pick, sometimes I'd miss the pick, it'd be riper, I'd add water, I'd have to add acid to the wine. Okay. And I think in the long term, it shows the wine. I think up front, the wines can show some level of balance, etc. And I, uh, again, these are for my own wines. I mean, whatever else does is their own. Their own thing. I mean, this, this shift, whatever, was not made for any kind of marketing purpose, whatever, just me and my own evolution of right. winemaking. So, does that mean that you were picking earlier, or are you actually sourcing from different sites that are cool no, and sites? It's always been a Paris Valley. I'm just picking. Okay. My definition of right has changed. I think what happened was is I was fixated on a number of having to be, you know, 24 and a half. You know, that was kind of like this right. happy place that I thought I needed to be. Okay. I had never uh, made Pinot Noir at all. I uh, worked for Martin Elliott Marcus and Okay. So you're, you're aiming for a lower bricks kind of you know, level to... Well, to in those six, I decided, I decided to... I had tried a couple of experiments in 03 and 04, kind of shifted a little bit. I lost all my fruit in 05 frost, so I didn't do anything there. Um, 06, I was just sampling. And... Uh, Really cold year. It got panned by the critics, but I think the best wines uh, to, at that point I had made for Pinot Noir specifically. And uh, you know we're sampling. I'm going up there, taking a five gallon bucket, crushing it up, and uh, you know seeds are brown. I'm getting like ripe flavors, and we're running the bricks, and it's like wow, this is friends like we have mining to treat Pinot. It's twenty two six. I'm like this. This can't taste like this. It's at this great acidity. It's got great color. Um, it's telling me to pick by tasting it, you know? Right. For me, and then kind of just also wanting to do a shift, so I'm just, the long and short of it, that's what I do with all wines. Right, that's and, great. And nothing to this day has come over, you know, 23 and a half is the highest of things can make it out. So the wines are all well under 14, and, and uh, it's the first time I ever had, I mean, never had, I don't have to have water, I don't have to have acid, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to adjust the wines. And not necessarily it's a bad thing, just for my own stuff is suffering. I think in the long term, again, I could rehash this again, but it, it uh, showed the lines as they got older. Okay. So do you feel like it, it mm -hmm. ends up being a more natural process overall? Um, since you're it feels more natural. Process. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't, I never went to school to do this, or I don't have an analogy degree, so I don't mm -hmm. fundamentally have any kind of science background to understand you know, certain parameters of it. But there's you know, basic parameters you understand. From a chemistry standpoint, but uh, I've never really made wine by the numbers until now, right. which is kind of odd. People say that they're picking all on flavor, and I understand that. I think at this point, I'd rather pick quote underripe and not have to add mm -hmm. anything to the wine, and then uh, let it be what's going to be. I mean, I've, I've you know I have friends who are producers of Burgundy, and they've got you know, famous domains, and they're they still pick on potential alcohols. Even in the right thing, like 05, you were saying, oh, 05 is right, and 03 is a moment because it's dried out. 
that's 05 as a right vintage. Um, people still decided to pick. The people that I know and respect are like saying, yeah, our, our Grand Cru is going to handle 13 eight to 14 percent alcohol. That's kind of like we can handle that potential. Our village stuff, we're going to get it from 13 to 13 four kind of range. And kind of they move up the, the ladder that way with certain producers. Do you, do you feel like you're doing the same with your different lines? Lines is it kind of a similar approach? Um, lines in, first. In, in terms of going from Tucson Sombo to some of your single vineyard. But lines Tucson is under fourteen as well. I mean, not, and again, this is an alcohol. This is not a fixation on alcohol. It's a it's a body. I mean, it, it's about proportion. I mean, people talk about oh, you want to emulate Burgundy. That's not necessarily. I mean, I, if I want to make Burgundy, I'm going to Burgundy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's Alex Gamble, other people. It's so like you can pack up you know, shop and go to Burgundy. I'm happy. I love Anderson Valley, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with making wines of, uh, that have the proportion of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. You know, that have the weight and the kind of like the lightness that still speaks to Pinot Noir, and that's what the goal is. I don't. I, that's plain and simple. I mean, very straightforward. Okay, but there was one more wine I wanted to ask you about, which is your. 06 to Saint Saint Le Pinot Noir. Um, is there kind of anything interesting that you could tell us about, about that particular wine? Well, the first attempt to do an Appalachian wine. It's uh, mm -hmm. the blend of a few of the vineyards that uh, we make vineyard resident wines from. And I kind of just gleaned off uh, parcels of the vineyards um, and clonal selections that I think didn't um, kind of speak of the, the, the vineyard itself. What that is, I don't know, that's my interpretation, but. Um, at the end of the day, it's uh, our first, you know, blended wine. So I kind of counter what I've done in the past, but uh, you know, all the most great domains have some type of good like village level, um, premier crew, you know, um, or Grand Rouge type. Um, again, not comparing it to that. It's just it's a, it's getting your it's a methodology from the standpoint of looking. Okay, we can make a blended wine that's. That still speaks to Anderson Valley. That uh, is be a little bit more affordable, that kind of thing. It's thirty dollars. Right. You know, it's not. It's uh, you know, and even our vineyards and wines in the, in the scope of what you pay for for Burgundy is still, I think, are really affordable. So I'm, I'm telling people, you know, buy the great domains of Burgundy you like and drink the Copan in, in the short term, the five to ten year range. Buy your, you know, Grand Cru X and serve your your domain and. And put that in your cellar, but you can drink Copan in the short term, along with their Bocon Rouges and their Delage wines, and it, it'll hopefully be you know, included in that mix. Great. Uh, and then with the 07, do you feel like um, it's just basically going for the same thing, or has the Testado or Two Sons on Road modulated at all? It's the same. I mean, 07 has more weight to the wines, it, it, even though they're light. Mm -hmm. They're picked to the same bricks levels. They're, there's a more breadth. Um, I guess I think 06 got panned. Unfortunately, by the critics, and uh, there are some people that make brilliant wines. I think the same wines are brilliant, but the point is, there are people on the coast that really make interesting wines, like Sonoma Coast, Santa Cruz Mountains, like Reese Vineyards. I mean, there's people that made some really cool wines that that obviously critics don't consider them to be um, benchmark areas to draw. Like you know, Nap Cabernet is like your basis for sometimes for you know, it's uh, Cabernet. You know, Napa is like the basis. Sometimes people take Russian River and call it you know, this is. Rush River Carneros, this is my baseline for calling a vintage. Well, there's pockets within all these things that make interesting wines. I think the beauty is, I mean, all, I mean the best winemakers and the toughest in the make the best wines. It's true in Burgundy, I think it's true in the, the New World, too. So I think it's, it's across the board, hopefully. Well, Wells, thank you so much for talking with us. Um, I think your wines are going to hold up very well against uh, all of the benchmarks that you talked about. So uh, we'll, we'll certainly be telling people about your wines, cool. and uh, I look forward to seeing your work every year as it comes out. We'll see. Work in progress. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank Thanks you so much, Charles.